in terms of introducing my, myself, well, I, I've given a few talks to this group before, I think twice or maybe even three times over the years. Um, and some people will possibly know me from the um, the Brexit blog that I write, Brexit and Beyond, um, or even the Brexit book that I've written. Um, but anyway, um, I, I'm actually at the end to come back to the, the blog. But um, today, um, well, originally when Gavin asked me to do the talk, it was just going to be a sort of like an update on Brexit and where we were with Brexit. But then, of course, uh, subsequently the election was called. Um, so I thought, you know, it probably made sense to, to focus a bit on the election uh, today. Um, or we might say how we got from taking back control and now it's become something like, don't mention the B word, and maybe, or probably, given what the polls say, it means we're going to discover what exactly this means and doesn't mean. Um, so this is the rough sort of outline of what I'm going to talk about. I'll, I'll try to keep it, you know, um, you know, fairly fairly brief. Um, but some idea about the Brexit silence in the in the in the campaign so far, anyway, um, and thoughts about it, why it still matters, um, and then mainly to sort of focus on, you know, I think the 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 the, <clears throat> the assumption given all the opinion polls has to be that Labour will win the election. I mean, the question of, of about how much seems to be more the question rather than whether. Um, so it, it, on the basis of that assumption, to sort of talk through some probable and possible developments we might get in relation to Brexit, and then finishing with a few, a few, a few questions um, about what some of that means. So in terms of the kind of silence about Brexit, I mean, you know, I think this is, it's interesting because because it's it is it's a silence, yet it's a silence which is constantly being commented on. And I mean, there was another piece in the uh, today's Observer by Andrew Rawnsley, which was uh, which, which which focused on this as well. Um, but the reasons for it are, you know, are ones that we 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 are fairly familiar with. I mean, I mean, the Tory situation is is kind of interesting because, you know, on the one hand, they can't, you know. If, if they would try to sort of boast about Brexit and say, well, this is what we've achieved. And after all, you know, this was the policy that they were elected on at the last election to get Brexit done. And, 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 and supposedly they did that. Um, and so you might expect them to be sort of boasting about what they had achieved, uh, what they'd achieved by doing so. But they can't really do that because, you know, there's not really very much to boast of. And the, if they were to try to do it, you know, most people would just not be convinced by it. But on the other hand, the people who do still believe in Brexit, they generally think that Brexit has been betrayed, that the government has delivered, you know, uh, Brexit in name only and 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 uh, not real Brexit, not my Brexit, all that kind of thing. And so and so so anything that the Tories might say about Brexit doesn't really work with either the anti-Brexit or the pro-Brexit audience. Um, Labour, well, we know that that you know right from the beginning, you know they've been sort of hamstrung because of their uh, concern about traditional Labour voters who who had, who had voted Leave and trying to get them back. But I think more than that, well, maybe not more than that, but alongside that, this idea, which I think is is quite, you know, is that they're right in this analysis that if they were to make it, a, you know, to make to make to make to make Brexit an issue. Well, if they say, well, Brexit has been damaging, then the question is, well, what will you do? And if you say, well, we'll rejoin the EU or, or, or maybe rejoin the single market, but so we'll rejoin the EU, then immediately the whole election would become about Brexit and nothing else. And the Tory attack would turn uh, on that. You can imagine every single interview with every Labour politician would be, OK, so when are you going to hold the referendum? What's the question going to be? Uh, what majority will be required? Uh, what you know? What, what what do you think you'll be able to agree with the EU? Will sixteen and seventeen year old be able to vote in the referendum? You know, all of these kinds of things, and so because Labour have have, have not uh, you know have have been fairly kind of silent about that. They've 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 about Brexit. They've been able to preempt the Tories turning it into a Brexit election. And of course, if the Tories could turn it into a Brexit election, then there would be much less much much more possibility of of. Tories and the Reform Party, you know, once again, kind of doing a deal and coming together uh, and um, 
and 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 uh, if not necessarily winning the election and certainly uh, certainly making any Labour majority much smaller. Um, so there's so though for the main parties there's that kind of silence. Um, the Lib Dems is a bit different and a bit more sort of complicated. I mean, you know, they I mean they have got we ought to say at this point we haven't, haven't actually seen any manifestos from the parties. Um, but but still, it's 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 sort of clear, you know, the the the, the liberals sort of move to a sort of policy of well, sort of rejoin one day, but um, but 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 not kind of immediately, and they have really adopted this quite sort of uh, again, it makes sense for them, this quite kind of narrow uh, tactic, if you like, of trying to focus particularly on disaffected uh, Tories, the sort of blue wall seats, and trying to pick up on a range of different kinds of grievances around. Um, Around how, how you know around around disaffection with the Tories, but also things like uh, river pollution and other kinds of issues, and so and so it's kind of they it, it, sort of been quite sort of targeted and not really focusing on Brexit as being the main issue. The Reform Party, of course, you know, it's very easy for them just to say, "Oh well, it's not our Brexit. Brexit has been betrayed." Um, they don't have to take any responsibility for it because they didn't because they because they because because you know they they were not in government so they can still sort of say oh well it could have been fine it could have been this it could have been that and of course the main pitch that they want to make is to say um is to say well um Brexit has been betrayed on immigration although actually you know Nigel Farage used to say oh all we want to have is an Aussie style you know points based system that's all we you know that's all we want to have control you know um and that is actually what 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 we've got with a points based immigration system. They just don't like the the the, uh, the fact that of what that that means in terms of in terms of numbers. But equally, they're not willing to be honest with their own voters about what it would mean if they were to implement their supposed um, policy of having um, net zero immigration. Um, they certainly, you know, not saying to their voters what that would mean for public services, what that would mean for the health service, what it would mean for social care, anything else. Um, but they're not really talking about Brexit per se anyway very much. They're mainly just talking about immigration. It's obviously clearly quite different in Scotland and Northern Ireland. And I mean, the SNP, and, and notably in the leaders' debate the other day, you know, um, um, Stephen Flynn, you know, he was talked to you know, quite clearly about Brexit. Um, but that, I suppose, is, is, you know, quite understandably, is bound up with their general policy on Scottish independence. Um and so it's trying to say, it, it, I mean, yes, it's about Brexit, but it's also about, it's been, I think it's primarily about saying, this is what having a London government inflicts on Scotland. Um, and Northern Ireland is sort of different again, but there are you know, particular issues for some of the unionist parties about, um, about uh, you know, about the Windsor framework and the Irish sea border and, and, and so on. But in the main kind of parties, it's, it's, and, 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 it's not really uh, featuring very much, um, but you know, Brexit does still matter. It still matters to voters. And I put up that that chart, which and those figures are are usually put up to say the opposite of what I'm saying. They sort of, sort of say, oh well, you know, Brexit isn't really that important anymore. People care more about the economy, healthcare, and so on. But I would make two points about that. I mean, one is just in and of itself the fact that 59 percent of of people, um, uh, you know, name Brexit. Uh, as a priority, um, that actually shows that it is still an important issue. You know, yes, maybe it's not so high as some of, the, of those other issues, um, but it hasn't gone away from uh, the public um, uh, mind or public interest. And of course, the other obvious thing to say is that is that on all of these other policy areas, particularly the the, the economy, but also healthcare, um, well, all of them, um, you know, in fact. Brexit makes a difference to all of those things. And so in a sense, they can't really be separated out. Um, it's also the case that most voters now think that it's a mistake. And that and that figure has now, you know, has now is now pretty has been pretty settled, uh, if not increasing, but certainly settled um, for, um, you know, for well over a, a year now, or, or even getting towards two years, um, and sort of settling towards a kind of a figure of sort of 55% thinking it was a mistake and 32 or maybe 33% thinking well it was the right thing to do. Um, and of course, if you strip out the don't knows, that becomes even more stark and you get sort of uh, something more like kind of 60, 60, 60, 40, 62, 38, um, uh, thinking it was uh, wrong versus thinking it was right. So people think it was a mistake. 
and most voters also think that it has been a failure, which is a slightly, it's a slightly different kind of question. Um, and that we sort of can see, you know, even even amongst um, even amongst uh, even amongst uh, conservative supporters, you know, there's there's, there's, there's only a thirty one percent who who you know who, who think that it's been more of a success. So um, now, of course, it's true that the 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 people who think that it hasn't been a success. Um, or who think it's been a failure, they have very different reasons for that. So by and large, people who voted uh, to leave and who think it's been a failure think that it was never, it was always going to be a failure. Whereas people who voted to leave, even if they think it hasn't been a success, they think it's, that it, it could have been a success if it had been done differently. But even so, um, you know, the overall the overall picture here is, is really kind of quite a stark one, you know, that, 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 that a clear majority of people think that Brexit has been a failure. Um, and of course, it still matters economically. And, you know, I mean, we can, there have been so many studies of this, um, and uh, there's no point going through them all again. But um, one of the more recent ones, this is the Cambridge Econom Econometric Study that was actually commissioned by um, by um, Sadiq Khan and the, the, the London Mayoralty. So it was focused on, on London, but, but these are the figures that they came up with for the UK as a whole. Um, and, you know, in, 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 in every dimension that one can look at, um, you know, the difference between what is is happening and is going to happen over the next 15 years compared with what would have happened if uh, if Brexit hadn't happened is pretty stark and perhaps the most stark of those figures is the um, is the is the calculation that um, the that investment by 2035 will be 32 about a third uh, lower than it would otherwise have been now of course these are uh, comparisons these are counterfactual comparisons so comparisons with what would have happened if Brexit hadn't happened um, and so it's not you know, people don't necessarily directly experience that because it's it's not it's not that something's been taken away from them. It's that something they would have had they're not receiving, but it feeds through into, in particular, issues about um, how much money is available for public services, um, and so in that sense, it's inseparable, uh, as I said earlier, from voters' uh, concerns about the economy and about the health service and so on. Um, so I don't. So 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 Brexit isn't being isn't being talked about, but it's still there all the time in the background. Um, and so we then come to the question of of well, what is going to happen after the election? And if we assume, you know, as everyone is, we assume that Labour are going to win, what can we expect to happen? And I think the first thing to say is, I don't think there's any uh, realistic expectation that the kind of the Labour red lines are going to be dropped. By which I mean. Uh, they're not going to uh, try to rejoin the EU or the single market. They're not going to try to have a customs union with the EU. Um, uh, but, it, but I think, nonetheless, you know, certainly quite important things will change. And one thing which will change for sure is the political dynamic uh, between the party leadership and the, and, and, and the party rank and file. Because the quite limited agenda that Starmer appears to have and the, and the Labour leadership generally appear to have around Brexit. It's quite limited, but they're all the time going to be pushed by their party members and by many of their voters to going further, to being closer to Europe rather than further away from Europe. Um, and similarly, the pressure to diverge from Europe, that will disappear. So it's going to be exactly the opposite situation to what the say the Sunak government has been in, where on on those occasions, which haven't been many, but they have existed, on those occasions when Sunak has uh, sort of you know sort of tried to be closer to Europe, and I suppose I'm thinking here of the Windsor framework and negotiating that, but also you know the way that he backtracked on scrapping the bulk of retained EU law. Um, and um, and rejoined Horizon and so on. These, you know, this any such initiatives by Sunak or by a Tory leader were always being done in the face of opposition from backbenchers, from party members, from many Tory voters, from the Reform Party on their right flank and so on. 
And all that dynamic is going to change. As soon as Labour come into office, um, the all of the pressure will be in the other direction, both inside the party and also uh, from businesses, from other lobby groups um, with an interest in this and so on. So the dynamic will very much change. And at the same time, at least to some extent, the the kind of the, the you know, the, the Brexit press, all of the uh, sort of right wing think tanks and so on, the whole kind of ecosystem of power and influence will change as it always does with, with any change of government. Um, and suddenly, you know, people whose voices were, you know, quite heard and quite influential within government circles will cease to be heard, will cease to be influential. Um, and that will be particularly true if there is a really uh, massive defeat for the Tories, um, because, uh, you know, that would then obviously, and if that means a, you know, a very big Labour majority, um, I'll come back to, to, to that in a second, but assuming it's a big, a big Labour majority, then, um, you know, then the power very rapidly drains away from the sort of the old guard, if you like, and, and becomes uh, it becomes newly focused. Um, and then specifically in political terms, you know, if, as seems likely to be the case, you know, the Tories are going to be really perhaps in considerable disarray, it may not last forever, but but initially, and if they have a very heavy defeat, um, if they are, you know, if they have if they have Nigel Farage talking as he is already about uh, trying to sort of uh, do a reform takeover of the Tory party, their, 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 their capacity to oppose anything they might do is going to be quite sort of diminished. So there'll be that general kind of change, but then looking in more specific areas, um, here are the things which I think we can be fairly sure are quite probable to happen. And, and on the on the on the on the left hand side of the screen, the things that Labour will try to do, and then on the right hand, I mean, this is just purely my uh, assessment or you know guesstimate, if you want to call it that of how likely it is that these things will actually be uh, agreed with the EU where they, where they need to be. Um, so, but I think the first thing is, you know, there's a very high probability that they will seek and they will achieve uh, a much better kind of tone to the relationship. And, you know, we shouldn't oh, make too big a deal out of that because it's not going to resolve anything in and of itself. But it's not trivial either, you know, because the relationship between the EU and, and the UK has been, you know, really awful uh, since Brexit. It's been a bit better since the Windsor framework, it's true. But the Labour government will not have, you know, will not be sort of tainted with any of those memories of the, uh, not just of responsibility for Brexit, but, but you know, all of the memories of the really often quite sort of dishonest ways that the Tory government conducted itself in the negotiations, the repeated threats to break international law over the uh, Northern Ireland Protocol in particular, and so on. You know, all of those things really have sort of scarred um, the relationship, and they they will they will they will begin to they will begin to heal. Uh, I think uh, that's fairly definite. Um, and then some other things. Uh, well, this maybe is 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 isn't so interesting, but um, but you know all of the stuff about having a. Uh, a UK conformity assessment mark instead of the the um, the, the the CE marking. I mean that effectively the Tories have have, have effectively dropped that anyway. But still, formally, it's meant to happen uh, in due course. I think that will be just completely dropped. That doesn't need EU agreement. Um, I think that, that you'll you'll immediately see, or we will immediately see, uh, a much more positive engagement with the European political community, which is a non-EU body. And I believe I'm right in thinking that the UK is meant to be hosting it, the next meeting of it in the uh, sort of middle of July, so just maybe a couple of weeks after the election. Um, and uh, I think I think I, I think I think that will 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 become um, a, a place of engagement. You can expect that they, they will Labour will try to have quite a maximal approach to the trade and cooperation agreement, which comes up for review in twenty. Uh, 20, uh, 2026, um, but the preparations for that will begin in 2025. Now, what does a maximalist approach mean and how much would the EU agree? Well, um, you know, that, 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 that sort of remains to be seen. I mean, in principle, it is only a review. It is not a renegotiation. Um, uh, 
and there's different uh, expectations about about the extent to which the EU would be willing to change it. Um, but some of the things, including things which are on this list, um, are things which in the past the EU have indicated they're interested in. And so I'm, I'm just jumping down the list here, but um, the idea of a, a sanitary and phytosanitary regulation or veterinary agreement uh, is something which Labour have been made clear they want to agree, uh, and which in the past the EU has said that they would be willing to agree. The devil's in the detail about what kind of agreement, but I think that's uh, that's something which is 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 realistically on the agenda. Um, and the other thing, a sort of mobility agreement, at least for certain kinds of people, um, and the, the big example is sort of musicians and and, and travelling performers and so on. Um, and you know. I mean that was that was initially going to be something that was going to be in the trade and cooperation agreement, but Johnson and Frost didn't pursue it. Uh, so there's every reason to think that the EU would be um, amenable to a, 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 an agreement on that. I mean, all of these agreements need to be in the interests of both the UK and the EU, but one can see that these things could be. And then coming back up the list, something which Labour have been pushed very very uh, have been very clear about is saying that uh, David Lammy in particular uh, saying that they would immediately seek uh, a defence and uh, sort of a deep defence and security pact with the EU. Um, and again, there's every reason to expect the uh, the the EU would agree to that for two reasons. One is because that was always in the political declaration, which was the non-binding, non-legally binding part of the withdrawal agreement, um, that there would be such a pact. But again, Boris Johnson and David Frost chose not to pursue it. Um, so we, the EU were open to that idea. And I think everybody believes and, and, and thinks that they are even more open to that in the sort of post-Ukraine environment. Um, and so we can expect that perhaps to happen. Another thing that Labour have said they will want to do is to is to get more mutual recognition of qualifications so that people, you know, of different with different professional qualifications can 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 move between countries and, and their and their qualifications still be recognized. I've marked that as being quite unlikely to be agreed with the EU, just because of the fact that you know, such agreements do exist between between countries, and the EU has them with some other countries, but they tend to be, or they have, they have historically been quite difficult uh, to negotiate. And, and so, I think anything that happens on that will probably be quite slow. I mean, all of this is going, none of this is is going to be immediate because everything takes time to uh, takes takes time to agree. But these are the kinds of things that that, that, that it seems pretty clear are going to begin to happen almost immediately that uh, Labour take power. I mean, almost immediately in the sense that Labour will begin almost immediately to seek to uh, do them. And then I come on to a second list, which are things which are sort of possibilities, perhaps rather than probabilities. And the reason I say that is mainly because, or partly anyway, because they're not things which Labour have necessarily explicitly spoken about. But the issue about and there's loads of acronyms here, which is which is a, a pain, I know. But um, the first issue, the issue about linking the... So CBAM is the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, which the EU are introducing, and the UK are introducing their own scheme. That's already happening. And it's likely to be actually very similar to the EU scheme. But the question is, and I think actually even under the Tories, this, this would probably be what they would try to do, um, is to actually formally link those schemes so that, and in particular, so that the emission trading systems, which which so what the carbon border adjustment thing does is effectively, it, it means that the importers, EU importers have to uh, pay according to the carbon content and the production of the good that they're importing. Um, but then there's a system for trading between, between companies, trading, um, uh, emissions certificates so that you can sort of uh, so that you can, there's a kind of buying and selling market and so the question is is the UK can't be part of it per se because it's not in the EU but these two systems could be linked and I think this is very likely to be achieved because there's actually something uh, there's there's actually a, a, a something in the 
uh, it's a general commitment within the trade and cooperation agreement to do something like that. Um, so I think that's quite likely, again, to happen quite quickly. Um, other things perhaps are less likely to be achieved in terms of possibly linking um, so REACH is the kind of chemical regulation system um, and linking the two systems at the moment. The, the UK REACH system is effectively a replication of the EU system. Uh, could they be linked? And the key, in a way, to linking those things is to do with database sharing. And that's really interesting because, um, because the reason why there's relatively little database sharing between UK and EU now is because database sharing with the EU involves a role for the European Court of Justice. And this was, again, something that Johnson and Frost didn't want to do because they saw it as violating sovereignty. Um, but if, if, as Labour have said very clearly, they want to have a deep security pact, that in itself entails having significant database uh, uh, interchanges of database access. And so if Labour are going to do that, and also with SPS as well, it will mean that they will, the one the one red line from Theresa May's day, the, Johnson's day that will go, is the red line about no involvement for European Court of Justice. And as soon as that red line goes, all kinds of other things become possible, including things like linking the chemical regulation systems. Um, and maybe this would apply to other kinds of, other kinds of, uh, uh, of, 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 of alignment by dynamic alignment, I mean, uh, a system whereby the UK undertakes to shadow um, uh, uh, EU law and regulation. Um, what I think is less likely is some people have talked about the idea that they could become a sector by sector deals with the EU, for example, for um, um, you know automotive sector or telecom sector, or something like that. That seems much less likely because that would be much closer to what the EU would regard as cherry picking. Um, but there are other things which which we, which I think are quite likely to happen uh, that the UK you know could, might well seek and, and I think might well be accepted back into the Erasmus Student Exchange uh, program. Um, I think there's, there's there's a strong possibility that Labour would uh, seek to join the Pan Euro Mediterranean uh, uh, Convention, and the significance of that is that. It, it, it's one of the it's one of the things that sort of determines what rules of origin apply, and that then affects what tariffs have to be paid. So the rules of origin are the things that say what percentage of the good is made in the UK or made in the EU, and it has to be a certain percentage to count for tariff free trade. And what the PEM Convention does is it's an agreement about rules of origin that would be beneficial uh, to, uh, to, uh, to both UK and and and, and the EU trade. And I think quite a lot of this kind of stuff is going to probably happen, you know, quite under the radar because most people, you know, talking in the in the pub, no one knows or cares anything about CBAM or PEM or anything like this. Um, and, um, you know, the only people who would really care about it are the kind of doctrinaire Brexit or sovereignists, and they're going to be too busy with other things. Um, so I think a lot of this stuff could happen quite quietly. Um other things which are maybe less likely, I think it's possible that that the that Labour might try to reapply to join the Lugano Convention. So this is a this is a thing which is to do with ensuring that commercial uh, co the, the the rulings of commercial courts in one country are binding in other countries, and it's very very useful uh, from the point of view of uh, trade in business services. Uh, the UK did reapply to rejoin and was rejected. Um, and so I don't know how likely it is that the EU would would accept it this time, but 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 not impossible perhaps. And then at the sort of other or at the more general level, um, perhaps even the idea of seeking some form of association agreement. So this was kind of touted very early on in the Brexit uh, process, the idea of having a relationship rather like uh, the relationship between the Ukraine and the EU, which would involve. Uh, effectively being in the single market for goods, uh, to some degree for services, uh, but not having freedom of movement um, uh, and having various other kinds of cooperation uh, uh, and so on. So it would be a more um, um, 
well, it will be a slightly softer form of Brexit than, than what we have. And the other thing on that list, which is really in a different category, is, you know, there's a whole lot of questions about how, what's going to happen in terms of the a Labour government's trade policy with the rest of the world. You know, is it still going to pursue uh, a trade deal with India, for example? Um, and if so, on what terms? Um, we assume, one assumes that they're going to proceed with CP, TPP ratification. Um, but all of these things are worth mentioning because the decisions the UK makes about the relationship with uh, other countries on trade in turn has an impact on the extent to which it can uh, remain aligned and continue to be aligned uh, with EU uh, regulations. So these things fit together. And Labour Party, again, we haven't seen the manifestos yet, but Labour, as far as I know, have really said nothing uh, about 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 that aspect of, of trade policy uh, at all. Um, so that's a kind of very quick run through, and, and some of it maybe is a bit obscure and, and not very interesting, but it adds up to a picture of um, uh, somewhat closer uh, and certainly somewhat more friendly relationship between the, e the UK and the EU. Um, how much difference does it make economically? Well, not a huge amount, um, but not nothing either. Um, I think there will be particular groups of people, uh, and I, I think I'm thinking particularly of um, um, smaller businesses uh, who are in the um, who who are trading um, uh, livestock or, or food, or, uh, you know, fresh produce, flowers, this kind of thing. Uh, life will become easier uh, for them, uh, although in many cases the damage has already been done. Um, and, and 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 you know, I think I, th I think some some labor labor politician or spokesman or, or commentator used the expression sort of sanding the rough edges of of the relationship. So, so it's like that. It's it's not going to it's not going to be a kind of a game changer, but it's going to be. Um, it's going to be a bit smoother than the current situation. But also, to go back to my opening point, we're not any any longer going to be in a, in a position where all the time there's the possibility of moving further away from the EU. I mean, that wasn't happening very much under the Tories anyway. But all I, I would say virtually all pressure for that will, 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 will disappear. Um, so finally, just thinking about a few political questions and, and, and obviously everything... You know, a lot depends on the size of the. the if they're, assuming there's going to be a Labour majority, you know, is it going to be as big as some of these projections that we've had recently suggest? Or indeed, some there have been some projections showing even larger majorities and even smaller numbers of Tory seats. Um, and I suppose, you know, an, an important question for certainly for sort of pro Europeans is, you know, would it be better if for, from a kind of European pro European agenda, if it was a sort of a, a small majority, and then maybe the SNP, Lib Dems, other parties would perhaps be, you know, pushing it further, pushing Labour towards having a bolder policy. But you know, um uh, I don't think that those kind of core red lines that Labour is going to negotiate those away um uh, in order to in order to in order to form a in order to to, to, to form a government. Um and, you know, you could argue more strongly that if there's a very big Labour majority and an absolutely crushing defeat for sort of Tories and, and reform, that that also would be in a sense, even though Brexit hadn't been a, an issue in the campaign in a formal sense, that that would be a kind of a... Uh, uh, a real blow, if you like, to the, you know, to, to, the, to the Brexit cause. Um, and... Um, um, and then there's also the sort of question about, well, what, you know, to what extent are the other media going to, you know, going to go on and on pushing a very pro Brexit agenda? Or actually, you know, we've seen over the last few years this sort of gradual, sometimes tacit, but more or less kind of acknowledgement from pro Brexit people where it hasn't really worked and will actually they become, you know, less and less vociferous. You know, less and less interested in uh, any uh, alignment, for example, that the Labour government might do with the e e EU. Uh, and then a final thought, which you know, I know interests a lot of European movement members, is what's the future for rejoining this? And, and I suppose 
you know, I, I would, I, I would, I would say you could think about this in two different ways. I mean, one is that that if there is a path to rejoin, then I think it has to go through something like what we seem to be likely to get from Labour. In other words, you know, making the relationship less antagonistic, staying and getting closer, uh, uh, you know, reforming, you know, relationships as, as a prelude towards eventual rejoining. But I suppose you could argue it another way and say, well, you know, what if this this kind of smoothing of the relationship, what if that is enough for people, you know, for the public in general to kind of think, well, okay, you know, Brexit wasn't Brexit, Brexit wasn't a good idea and it hasn't gone very well, but it's not, you know, but it's not causing terrible problems anymore. And you could actually envisage in some ways the some of the um some of the um, steam or, or pressure to rejoin, sort of gradually eroding, precisely in in parallel to some of the uh, some of the, the, the you know some of the, the biggest kind of uh, frictions and antagonisms between the EU and the UK uh, also being eroded. So these are very unknown kinds of things, and of course we're not even at the at the election yet. But um, um, but uh, I think you know it, despite in a way, Brexit not being talked about as an issue, it is an important moment, this election, I think, in terms of um, in terms of the Brexit process. And as I say, to come back to my opening point, if only because of the fact that if Brexit had been remotely a success, then we would be having a very, very different kind of election campaign to what we are having. Um, and indeed, you know, very likely the whole situation that the Tory party and Tory government would be in would be very different uh, as well if Brexit had been uh, demonstrably be a success. So it's a, a a moment in what is a ongoing journey. And uh, then to come back to um, where I started to kind of keep on top of it, well, I would always recommend reading my weekly Friday morning Brexit blog. It usually gets published about 8 or 8.30 uh, in the morning. Um, and even for those of you who haven't done so, you might want to read uh, read my book about how we got here, Brexit Unfolded.